Thank you very much, Grace, for this introduction, and thank you to the organizers for this important event. I have the difficult task of delving in 10 minutes into uh, quite a vast topic that is hard to discuss in such a short time, but I will do my best to give you some key points. Because as I, I was looking at the, the title and the theme of this conference, where we speak about human dignity and freedom, I thought it would be important to first start with the question, what is the true nature and meaning of human dignity? Because there is a lot of misunderstanding about that. What the true nature and meaning of human dignity is? It's, it's also often misused in political discourse. So I would like to do today is very briefly in a first point, go back to the roots of this question. Because really, if we want to understand what human dignity is and what it entails and why it informs our freedom, there is no way around going back to the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verse 26. We all know this part of scripture very well. And out of that come three elements that define our human dignity and that at the same time show you why in secular society there is so much of misunderstanding about that. The first one is that God created us in his own image and likeness. The second element is that the human being was given dominion over the earth. And the third one, the most contentious unfortunately these days, is that we were created male and female and with that given co-creatorship with God. And we were asked to multiply. God never spoke about overpopulation. So there are three, if you want to summarize this in three words, human dignity entails reason, because reason is something we have been given by our creator, rule because we have been given dominion over the earth and called to subdue it and third responsibility so the core understanding of human dignity entails reason rule and responsibility and this automatically leads to the next stage and that is to the freedom that flows from that and our ability to exercise our free will that is a result of those three elements of human dignity. And then we can distinguish in human dignity between what I would like to call a passive human dignity and an active human dignity. The passive human dignity is th the mere fact of being human. It's inherent our human dignity. There's nothing we have to do for it. We were created that with that from the moment of conception. It's there, it's inherent. And on the other side, which is in a way a direct fruit of this inherent dignity, is our so-called active human dignity. It's by acting human, in Christian terms, by being living in charity by doing charity, by acting in a human way. This is, so to say, the more attained version of human dignity. But the one doesn't exclude the other, and the one is not possible without the other. Because human dignity is not merely a nice theory. It's something we are called to live. And if we understand those two elements of human dignity, the passive and the active, based on reason, rule, and responsibility, then we come to the next stage of understanding human dignity, and that is that the person represents the ultimate end of society. And this is so important to underline that. Not technology, not progress, not economic considerations, not science, it's the person that represents the ultimate end of society and should present the ultimate end of politics. Not re-election or not success in this or that. 
It's the person that represents the ultimate end of society. Coming from that, human dignity is prior to society. It's pre-political. And the state not respecting this loses moral compass. And we see that all around us today. States that deny that lose moral compass. And this then finally leads us to what would one could call the core of all that. And that is that our human dignity gives us the ability to listen to our conscience. Of course, that conscience needs to be formed and distinguish between good and evil. So in one word, that core is the dignity of man is its ability to obey its conscience. This is very briefly, very concisely put together. What is the nature of human dignity? Now, some misunderstandings are it's not about feeling or opinion. It's not something that is granted by the state. And it is not science and technology that provide human dignity. They have to support or protect it. Which brings me to my second point. There are three fundamental rights specifically under threat due to this misunderstanding. And that is the protection of life, freedom of conscience and religion, and bodily integrity. My perceived human dignity can never come at the cost of my neighbor's human dignity. And therefore, it can never be an act of justice and dignity to kill another human being or deny its freedom of religion or harm its bodily integrity. Freedom of conscience and religion is thus the most fundamental expression of a human person's dignity because it pertains to the core of who we are and how we act and whether we accept God or our own human self as the measure of all things. And this is where we see the problem in society today. It's this last point where we have to struggle and where freedom is at stake. Which brings me to my third point. And that is the question, how free or unfree is our modern society really? And if we take a closer look at liberal democracy today and some of its recent challenges and failings, we should ask ourselves the question, what is the way forward? Since God is declared dead in modern secular society, we have cut off the root principle of human dignity and reverted instead to opinions and feelings on the one hand and technology and science as the new God on the other hand, as our new moral order instead of the human being's transcendent nature. And this leads to despair because it's obvious that this has limits and it leads to what I would call and other authors has called technocratic progressivism that ultimately brings us to the tyranny of self-made man that knows no limit to its perceived powers because it's convinced of its own exclusive good. Let me brief you, give you a quote there that puts that very well into words. It's by C.S. Lewis. Of all tyrannies, a tyranny sincerely exercised for the goods of his victims may be the most oppressive. Those who torment us for our own good will torment us without end, for they do so with the approval of their own conscience. And here I have to address, as I come to a conclusion, the elephant in the room. Because although that's not part of our theme here, we cannot ignore and we cannot deny to speak about that. What we have lived the past two and a half years in the COVID crisis and the measures that governments have taken from lockdowns to mask and vaccine mandates and border closures 
we really seriously have to ask ourselves the question, do we realize that freedom is at stake? Because this was not, uh, mentioned before by one of the speakers. I think it was uh, Jose Antonio who mentioned that. We see a cancellation of the person in our society. And shouldn't we ask ourselves the question if that isn't, despite the medical emergency that we have seen in the past two and a half years, shouldn't we still ask ourselves the question if that isn't what we have reverted to, to the cancellation of the person, to locking up whole populations, to taking away people's bodily integrity by certain mandates? It's a question we need to ask ourselves if we are serious about speaking that freedom is at stake, because that's part of our freedom. So as we asked ourselves the question, what is the way forward? Then I think there are three elements that we should take into consideration. And I was very grateful for the State Secretary of the Family from Brazil for her wonderful testimony that she spoke about coherence. Because I think what we need is coherence in education, in family policy, and in encounter. And this last element of encounter is what we need to bring back in a society where social life was closed down, where debate was closed down, and where freedom was indeed at stake. Thank you.